Uh, you know, I spent most of my life enjoying the simple things, the little things, as it were, that God brought into my life that once He had given me something, I appreciated it and I treated it as important to me. Because I looked in the long term of my Christian experience of knowing God and I figured that since the world was passing away and the lust thereof and the things that were all around me weren't going to last, I never had a clinging, clutching kind of feeling about them. If something came into my life, I said, thank you, Lord. If something went out of my life, I said, thank you, Lord, and I let it go. So in my life, I held lots of jobs and I didn't attach my self-esteem to the job because I was greater than the job and the job was just something to provide income that I might be able to use, I felt, for the ministry or for living or going on with doing something in the Lord. Lots of people, sadly, get their self-esteem from their work and they get caught up in the whole idea that if they lose their job, they lose their self-esteem. But you see, God loves you so much that He doesn't say that He loves you the way you are or the way you weren't or the way that you could be or the way that you should be. He just loves you, period. You see, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. What that means is that as you are today, as He sees you, as you exist right now, whether you're in sin or whether you're out of sin or whether you're whatever, God is greater than your present circumstances and what you think you are. Because He knows that you have no control lots of times over how you are because you were born in sin, you were conceived in sin, and you would die in sin unless, unless one thing happened unless God himself intervened in your life in a personal way, unless God himself made a change in you that you couldn't do for yourself, unless God himself, as being God, decided to help you, to change you, to give you a way to not be as what your normal attitude, actions, direction, and choices are. Because that's what being born again is. God intervening in your life. Jesus came to demonstrate that, to show us that, to say, look, I know you've got this idea of what you think God is, but I want to tell you about my Father. I want to tell you about someone I know personally and intimately. I want to tell you about who He is with me. And so He did. And then He said, look, I'm not just saying you should know God and be some kind of religious fanatic. I'm not saying you should know God and be some kind of righteous person. I'm saying God loves you enough to give you a way of being forgiven so that you could have a personal relationship with Him. And so He went and died to give us that personal relationship. And if that was the end of it, then we would all be religious. We would all have these religious ideas and we'd have these religions going around and we would all come up with our own thought process. But something unique happened that's different than any other religion. Jesus rose from the dead like he said he would. That made and confirmed the reality that there's more to life than this existence. There's more that's going on in this world than just being caught up in it with your job, with your finances, with your love life, with your present circumstances, with the people that are in your life, with the people that you've lost from your life. There's more to living than life itself. There is God, and He will be the one you face when you die. And if you were born again, if you have found salvation from that which was causing you to sin, if He has brought to you a newness of life, that he has forgiven you of your sins, then you are following hard after to know him in a personal and intimate way. And that's what Jesus said to do. And that's what we do when we read our Bibles, when we read devotionals, when we open up the Word of God, when we hear him say, 
you can know God personally today in an intimate way that you could actually talk to Him and hear Him say to you personally, I love you. That is what God is. Now, your reaction to Him is your choice. You can do anything you want to do. You literally have the freedom to choose or not. And you can do and act according to your old nature or you could become more like your new nature that God has put inside you. And the way that we do that is by reading his word, by sharing in devotionals, by learning to listen to what he would say to us personally each and every day that we're alive. Because if he knows what's going to happen right now, this moment, and has arranged it in a certain way to reveal himself, wouldn't you like to get to know him more intimately? Wouldn't you like to begin to prove to yourself that God is alive? That God is real? That Jesus said what he meant and meant what he said and that you can trust in him and not our own interpretations of him? I think the choice is yours to make. Would you hear what God would say to you today? I hope so. I know I'm going to. And that's why we read in Spurgeon today. They weave the spider's web from Isaiah. See the spider's web and behold it in a most suggestive picture of the hypocrite's religion. It is meant to catch his prey. The spider fattens himself on flies and the Pharisee has his reward. Foolish persons are easily entrapped by the loud professions of pretenders and even the most judicious almost cannot escape. Philip baptized Simon Magnus, whose guileful declaration of faith was soon exploded by the stern rebuke of Peter. Custom, reputation, praise, advancement, glory, and other flies are the small game which hypocrites take in their nets. A spider's web is a marvel of skill. Look at it. Admire the cunning hunter's wiles as the spider sheds its web. Is it not the deceiver's religion equally wonderful? How does he make it so barefaced a lie to appear to be truth? How can he make his tinsel answer so well the purpose of gold? A spider's web comes all from the creature's own bowels. The bee gathers her wax from flowers. The spider sucks no flowers, and yet she spins out her material to any length. Even so, hypocrites find their trust and hope within themselves. Their anchor was forged on their own anvil, and their cable twisted by their own hands. They lay their own foundation and hew out the pillars of their own house, disdaining to be debtors to the sovereign grace of God. But a spider's web is very frail. It is curiously wrought, but not enduringly manufactured. It is no match for the servant's broom or the traveler's staff. The hypocrite needs no battery of Armstrong to blow his hope to pieces. A mere puff of wind will do it. Hypocritical cobwebs will soon come down when the besom of destruction begins its putrefying work. Which reminds us of one more thought, that being that such cobwebs are not to be endured in the Lord's house. He will see to it that they and those who spin them shall be destroyed forever. O oh my soul! Be thou resting on something better than a spider's web? Be it the Lord Jesus Christ and his eternal hiding place that I might find myself in him and not caught up in what the spider might spin? Often people tell me about how they hate what they see in Christians. Often people say to me what they don't like about preachers and teachers and how somebody's super spiritual this and they get into all these gifts that and they roll around on the floor and bark like dogs and act like idiots and sometimes show more enthusiasm than they do the realism of knowing God in a personal way. That is their own expression of how they feel, not what God has said. Because what they feel sometimes is influenced by what they have seen. And what we know are usually those things we've experienced for ourselves in a personal and intimate way. So when you get alone, when you take the time to be still, when you open the Bible by yourself, with yourself, ask God to reveal himself to you 
and he has promised he will always show you who he is, what he is, and how he operates to you, because he promised in Jesus that he would reveal to you Jesus. He would show you who God is, and that you did not need that any man teach you, but the Spirit of God who dwells within you, he would lead you into all truth. So, if you ever feel frustrated or angry or mad or somehow discombobulated or discomfited by something you see or have heard, then ask God about it. Because you're not trusting in the religion of Christianity. You're trusting in the Lord with all your heart, leaning not into your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledging Him and letting Him direct your path. It's not about a pastor telling you what to do. It's about God leading you where you should go and how you should be as you live day by day with the Lord your God, the Lord in you, the Lord guiding you, and Jesus being with you always, even unto the end of the age. Men will pass away as well as the world, but Jesus will be with you always. He promised it, he said it, <laughs> and I think you can have confidence that he will do it.